into the atmosphere, ensuring complete global saturation. Resident Evil 5 Resident Evil 5 is precisely what occurs when you have an excess of a positive thing. Excessive indulgence in anything has the potential to be detrimental to your well-being, and Resident Evil 5 epitomizes what transpires when you push these positive elements too far. That is the essence of Resident Evil 5. Something I overlooked in my Resident Evil 4 video was the adverse impact the game had on the franchise. You see, Resident Evil 4 was a resounding success, both critically and commercially. It was evident that the new direction the franchise took with this game resonated well, at least for Capcom, that is. When you're receiving nothing but praise and raking in millions of dollars, how can you argue otherwise? There seemed to be no compelling reason to revisit the older RE games that laid the groundwork for the franchise. RE4 marked the beginning of what many would deem as the franchise's dark ages, and nowhere is this more apparent than in this particular game. Upon my thorough analysis of this game, I've come to realize that it may not be as exceptional as I once thought. While I vividly remember feeling that the game was unfairly criticized for deviating too far from the franchise's roots, I still can't confidently assert that it's an underrated gem. To me, this game is the RE0 of its era of Resident Evil, and despite the clickbait title of my video, I don't actually hate Resident Evil 0. However, I do believe it's a lackluster, inferior iteration of the games that preceded it, just as Resident Evil 5 is a less impressive and more mediocre version of RE4. So, without further ado, let's delve into Resident Evil 5. Captain Deshant here. We secured the underground route to the coordinates. I opted to show that initial scene in its entirety to underscore the shift towards a more serious atmosphere this time around. This change could likely be attributed to Shinji Mikami, the franchise's architect and lead producer since RE2, wasn't even part of Capcom during most of Resident Evil 5's creation. At the start of development, he had already transitioned to another internal studio after completing Resident Evil 4. While no concrete evidence is cited, speculation suggests this move might have stemmed from Capcom's decision to pour RE4 to other platforms against Mikami's desire for it to remain a GameCube exclusive. Mikami had a strong affinity for exclusivity, evident from his support for the GameCube with titles like Resident Evil Remake and Zero. It's fair to infer that Mikami felt let down by his superiors, though 
I, I think one can understand Capcom's motivations here. It's evident that there was a misunderstanding within Capcom regarding the Resident Evil franchise's trajectory. The rapid transformation seen with RE4 was likely a response to commercial struggles attributed to the series' perceived stagnation. However, I, I believe the consoles on which these games were released played a significant role in their lackluster performance. Reflecting on Mikami's subsequent relocation within Capcom and the following closure of this in-house studio, which not only housed the talents of Mikami, but even Hideki Kamiya, the creator of Devil May Cry, I believe provides context for the franchise's subsequent direction. It's a tale that sheds light on the path Resident Evil would take moving forward. The game kicks off with Chris Redfield, notably more muscular this time around, delivering a somewhat uninspiring narration of in-universe lore since our last encounter with the franchise. Frankly, it fails to engage. Upon reviewing the opening scene, I found myself zoning out during Chris's exposition, struggling to stay focused despite multiple attempts to grasp the narrative. The introduction feels like a lesser imitation of Leon's memorable debut in Resident Evil 4. Nevertheless, it reiterates that Umbrella has been dismantled, yet the specter of bioterrorism still looms large after the fall of Raccoon City. Consequently, the world's governments enlist the Global Pharmaceutical Consortium to combat this threat, ultimately leading to the formation of the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance, also known as BSAA. While the specifics are somewhat murky, it's evident that Chris is affiliated with the BSAA. Tasked with infiltrating bioterrorism hotspots to restore order and safety to afflicted regions, the groundwork is laid for potential future exploration of the Global Pharmaceutical Consortium's role in upcoming titles. However, Chris's affiliation with the BSAA remains clear, hinting the direction that this narrative continues to take throughout. Welcome to Africa. My name is Sheva Alamo. Chris Redfield. Your reputation precedes you, Mr. Redfield. It's an honor. So, Sheva here, who is our other protagonist, joins Chris on the journey to the undisclosed destination. Her presence serves a crucial diplomatic purpose, intended to ease tensions with the locals. Chris's entry into the area would likely provoke hostility due to recent governmental changes making Sheva's role essential in navigating this volatile territory. With a change in government turning the area into a haven for bioterrorists, the BSAA is tasked with restoring order. This section of the scene ends with a tantalizing hint suggesting Jill Valentine's demise, a move seemingly aimed at retaining interest from longtime Resident Evil fans. It's a bit on the nose, perhaps, but effective in promoting players to ponder the fate of this iconic character, providing an initial hook to keep them invested in the unfolding narrative. Chris appears visibly disheartened, questioning the purpose behind their ongoing struggle. These continue to mount over the long years I've struggled. More and more, I find myself wondering if it's all worth fighting for. Maybe one day, I'll find out. A sentiment that adds an intriguing layer to his character. However, this introspection is somewhat fleeting, only resurfacing at the game's conclusion. Throughout the narrative, Chris doesn't seem to grapple with any significant internal conflict, leaving this initial moment of doubt somewhat pointless. <sighs> okay, um, I have to admit, this opening hook doesn't quite capture my interest like other Resident Evil games in the past. While I don't necessarily consider Resident Evil games to be paragons of storytelling and gaming, I do believe that a clear narrative direction is crucial for driving the game forward. The Resident Evil franchise typically excels in this aspect providing players with clear and understandable goals. In fact, most well-crafted stories in general do just this. Take for instance, The Last of Us.
Widely acclaimed for its storytelling, the game's main objective is straightforward. Transport a teenage girl immune to a devastating infection across the country to potentially find a cure. This overarching goal remains constant throughout the game, anchoring the narrative and providing a clear sense of purpose. Well, you might be saying it's unfair to compare Resident Evil 5's story to The Last of Us, and I'm actually inclined to agree. So let's compare this game's story to Resident Evil 4, where the main goal is to rescue the president's daughter, demonstrating the effectiveness of a simple yet compelling objective. Despite any complexities introduced by side plots, the central mission remains prominent, guiding the player through various challenges. Unfortunately, Resident Evil 5 lacks this overarching goal, causing the narrative to suffer as a result. This absence of a clear narrative drive detracts significantly from the overall experience here. Anyways, Chapter 1-1 begins with a stroll through a civilian checkpoint, where we learn of an impending black market weapon deal set to take place in the city of Kijuju, our current location. As we navigate the area, we're given a glimpse into the unsettling activities occurring around us. Eventually, we encounter a genuinely eerie scene that is supposed to set the tone for what lies ahead. To this day, I have to admit, this scene remains incredibly creepy. It's also widely unrealistic, but the notion of so many people vanishing into thin air is genuinely terrifying. We rendezvous with our contact at the butcher shop and receive some equipment. Sheva inquires about the destination coordinates, but our companion here just basically ignores her. Destination coordinates? Town squares up ahead. Go through there. Alpha team's waiting at the deal location. Dude, she she asked for the coordinates. Well, what the hell do you mean just go through there? What do you know about Uroboros? Mostly just rumors. Something about visions of a doomsday project. Doomsday sounds about right, and apparently it is no rumor. You're kidding, right? You must find a man named Irving. He is our only lead. And be careful out there. Now, a couple more mysteries are introduced to the story. Uroboros and a man named Irving, who was previously mentioned at the chapter's outset. There's a black market weapons deal going down in Kijuju. That's where Irving will be. Continuing through the deserted butcher shop and a dimly lit alley, we hear a man's frantic shouts emanating from a nearby building. Intrigued, we investigate and are met with a rather unsettling sight. Freeze! Are you okay? I have to admit, these initial scenes excel at setting a scary tone for the game, even if it's quickly cut short from here. Once we kill this guy, we leap through a window into a nearby alley. We continue to draw the attention of all the locals, likely due to all the commotion that was caused earlier. Passing through what appears to be another butcher shop, we descend into an old, disused well and find ourselves in a shed, eventually emerging into the town square. Entering a nearby shop, it's evident that our contact has stirred up some trouble. Ah! 
wanaozuia njia ya Paranito Mwisho wao ni Jehono You don't know what you're talking about You can all go to hell Wait a minute That's the Kipo for what Wanaozuia Oh shit. Similar to Resident Evil 4, we find ourselves facing a horde of Magini, making for an intense encounter. The situation escalates with the appearance of the Executioner, wielding a massive axe and proving to be incredibly resilient to gunfire. It's a challenging ordeal, made worse by our limited access to powerful weapons at this point. Luckily, the BSAA chopper pilot, Kirk, arrives just in time to provide assistance. He blasts a hole through the gate of the town square, creating an escape route for our heroes. Chapter 1-1 kicks off with an interesting start to the game's journey. It's evident that the game is attempting to echo the thunder of Resident Evil 4's introduction. A mysterious village, infected inhabitants, a tense showdown in a town square, and an intense encounter with a mini-boss. It feels like a beat-for-beat -beat recreation of RE4's intro, and it doesn't quite deliver the same satisfaction the second time around. While the intro isn't necessarily bad, the introduction to the new setting lacks the grip needed to immerse me fully in the narrative. It feels like the developers were trying too hard to replicate what worked in RE4's intro, rather than crafting something fresh and original. Okay, let's go. Who the fuck trying to nut in my butt, bitch? Beginning chapter 1-2, the large group of Magini have been dispersed, and with the path clear, we proceed to the checkpoint to rendezvous with Alpha Team. As we navigate through some back alleys, we overhear the Alpha Team coming under attack from an unknown monster. Do you copy? The Continuing down the alley, we witness a random American woman being dragged away. Not really sure why she's here. It's kind of kind of weird, actually. Emerging in a nearby courtyard, we see her being pulled away once more. compelling us to rush up the stairs to intervene. Unfortunately, our rescue attempts take a grim turn when we discover she's infected. Are you okay? As we try to take her down, a plaga erupts from her head. While the story doesn't explain this until later, I'll clarify it now. The parasite afflicting the Magini is the same strain that infected the villagers in Resident Evil 4, known as Las Plagas. However, this is an advanced form of Las Plagas, engineered for faster infection, a significant enhancement over the original strain, which played a crucial role in thwarting Sadler's plans in RE4. Anyways, yeah, we kill her and proceed to a nondescript building. Upon entry, a chilling scream pierces the air. Later, accompanied by black sludge oozing from the ceiling. Undeterred, we press forward and encounter the bodies of Alpha Team. As we continue, we enter a room with more corpses and discover the Alpha Team's captain, Deshant. Hey. 
they... Who did this? Something attacked us. Irving. He got away. It was a setup. A setup? What is this? It's dead regarding the deal. I downloaded it from their computer. Oh, you gotta get it to HQ. Oh. Hey, hey, hang in there. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think he's dead, Chris. We follow the path that Sheva spotted the man running down and retrieve the key for a door leading to the exit located in an industrial sized furnace. However, as we attempt to leave, we are suddenly thrust into the first boss fight of the game. What the hell is that? I, I really don't understand Resident Evil's fixation on this enemy design. Like, how many times do we have to encounter these leech-like looking creatures? It, it's just tiresome. Too bad it took them so long to move on from this shit. We incinerate the guy in the furnace and prepare to leave. Afterwards, we locate the Alpha Team's Humvees and upload the data to a computer. Chris casually drops Leon's name in a nod to Resident Evil 4, and BSAA HQ essentially tells us to go fuck ourselves. This is HQ. Excellent work out there. We'll analyze the data immediately. This whole town's gone to hell. The people here, they're acting like those Ganado detailed in the Kennedy report. And aside from that, there's something new, something we've never encountered before. Our transportation has been taken out too. Requesting a mission update. The mission stands. Capturing Irving is your top priority. We believe he may have fled to the mines on the other side of the train station. Wait, we're the only two left. You want us to go in there alone? Delta team have been dispatched and are on their way. They'll assist you in locating and apprehending Irving. But wait, we can't! I repeat, your mission stands. We can't afford to let him get away. Proceed to the mines beyond the station. Over and out. This is insane! You ever get the feeling you're expendable? And that wraps up chapter 1. Overall, the chapters in this game are much shorter compared to Resident Evil 4. It seems they trimmed down on some sub-chapters to give the illusion of length. Along with this, they also send us to countless locations throughout the game, but we'll delve into that as we progress further into the video. This introduction to the world of Resident Evil 5 is serviceable. Uh, it ultimately feels really unoriginal though. As mentioned earlier, Chapter 1-1 closely mirrors Resident Evil 4 beat for beat. Transitioning to Chapter 1-2, it doesn't offer much improvement. While exploring the side streets is intriguing, the sudden appearance of a random white woman in the heart of West Africa feels really out of place. Especially when the script has already made it a point that Americans aren't exactly welcome in this city. It's a weak start to the game, especially considering that our objective has already been shifted from intercepting the black market weapon deal to now focusing on capturing Irving. Showcasing what I talked about earlier with the shifting of our main objective throughout the story. When discussing the gameplay mechanics for Resident Evil 5, I would be expressing many of the same sentiments I conveyed in my RE4 video. On the surface, this game mirrors RE4 in terms of gameplay, essentially being an RE4 clone. However, there are nuances to this game that do differentiate it. One of the initial observations I made was the newfound ability to strafe from left to right, although this feature can lead to unintentional mishaps with movement on the controller particularly complicating rounding corners, so I promptly disabled it as it proved to be more annoying than actually beneficial for me. Another aspect I noticed right away was the heightened aggression of the enemies, known as the Magini. They exhibit greater speed and aggression compared to the Ganados, are more numerous, and tend to surround the player more frequently. While this may sound promising in theory, 
As I stated previously, the main control scheme remains unchanged from RE4. By the time RE5 was released, these controls felt archaic, especially considering that games like Dead Space, released a year earlier, successfully evolved the gameplay to accommodate faster and more aggressive enemies. The inclusion of the partner mechanic attempts to balance the heightened challenge posed by these aggressive adversaries. However, while this may offer some semblance of balance, it fails to deliver a truly satisfying gaming experience overall. The constant frustration of dealing with swarms of enemies diminishes the enjoyment significantly, unlike the original RE4, where enemy mechanics complemented the player's abilities and resources. RE5's enemies feel mismatched with the outdated control scheme. Regarding the partner mechanic, players have two options, solo play with an AI partner or co-op with a friend. The best way to enjoy this game, in my opinion, is through online or split-screen co-op, where traversing the world of RE5 with a friend can be a genuinely enjoyable experience. Unfortunately, playing solo exposes the shortcomings of the AI partner, Sheva. Her AI frequently falls victim to enemy attacks and squanders ammunition, leading to considerable frustration throughout the game. Unlike Resident Evil Zero, players cannot leave Sheva in a safe spot while attending to other tasks. She accompanies them throughout the entire game. The partner system introduces separate inventories for each character, allowing for item trading. However, since this doesn't pause the game, coordination becomes challenging. This gameplay system coupled with cramped inventory detracts from the game's enjoyment overall. The inventory management feels cumbersome and ill-suited for the the fast-paced, action-oriented gameplay of RE5. Although the inclusion of quick slots is a positive addition, allowing for rapid equipment changes, is not really a sufficient trade-off for the inventory's shortcomings. It's strange why Capcom opted to retain the inventory system from the older RE games, as it proves detrimental to the overall experience here. Despite all its flaws, RE5's gameplay is serviceable, albeit lacking the same level of enjoyment as its predecessor, Resident Evil 4. Revisiting this title revealed the game's shortcomings here, highlighting the disparity between my personal nostalgia and reality. Chapter 2-1 begins with the duo pressing on to the train yard to locate Irving. Overall, I think this chapter feels somewhat underwhelming. While there are some interesting settings, such as the docks adjacent to the warehouse, much of the chapter feels unremarkable. Running through containers, we emerge near a bridge. Here we face off against a truck, a scenario very reminiscent of previous encounters in the franchise. Continuing through some sewers, we encounter a new type of plaga that can fly. We traverse through a small market and emerge on the other side of the building. Briefly, we catch sight of our support helicopter, piloted by Kirk, going down due to the plagas we encountered earlier. Our new side objective is to head to the crash site. Easier said than done though, as we're confronted by the Chainsaw Magini. It's like Capcom couldn't resist the temptation to throw this in here. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we get it, Capcom. We, we, all, we all liked RE4 too. Well, the Chainsaw Magini is an absolute bullet sponge. It's ridiculous how many shots it takes to bring him down. You have to hit him in the same spot so many times before he even flinches. I, I, I guess it's effective since there are fewer Magini around during this fight, but it's still pretty frustrating. Even the shotgun barely phases this guy. Well, I, I managed to take him down with one of Chris's lethal uppercuts, and we move on. Emerging on the other side of the building, we finally reach the helicopter crash site. Well, Kirk is dead, and we're quickly ambushed by some Magini on motorcycles. Originally, this was a QTE-driven cutscene in the original version of the game. However, Capcom added a update later on to the PC version, at least, allowing for auto-completion of QTE events and various cutscenes throughout the game. This feature is set on by default, and I wasn't aware it could actually even be changed. 
Then again, I, I didn't really care much for the QTE cutscenes in this game to begin with. It's hard to describe, but there was just less time to hit the QTEs in the cutscenes compared to Resident Evil 4. There was this sort of pause in RE4 that wasn't present in this game, making it really difficult to avoid death during these events. So honestly, I'm glad they're removed in this update. The Delta team comes to our rescue. The captain, Josh, gives us a data file containing information about Irving's whereabouts, suggesting he is in the mining area. After handing it over, Josh just kind of leaves. We'll follow after taking care of business here. And keep your radio handy just in case. Thanks, Josh. What business? Dude, aren't you supposed to be assisting us in capturing Irving? Delta team have been dispatched and are on their way. They'll assist you in locating and apprehending Irving. Apprehending Irving. So that was a fucking lie. I mean, yeah, th this wouldn't make it so that it was just Chris and Sheva for the next section of the game. But like, why does the story have to do this type of shit? Like, couldn't you think of something like better to make it so that Delta team wasn't able to assist us? Nah, nah, we just we just got business. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what the fuck? In chapter 2-2, we navigate through the train yard and descend into the mines. There's a neat section in the caves where one character has to hold the light while the other protects them. It's actually a pretty good idea and adds some freshness to the gameplay. Amidst the attack from the Magini, we eventually reach a centralized location in the mine. After surviving the ambush there, we exit the mines via an elevator. Ascending the flight of stairs, we finally come face to face with Irving, a rather eccentric character, to say the least. So you must be Irving. Wow, perceptive, aren't ya? You think this is a joke? You're just like all the other pieces of scum terrorists. Oh, I'm not like them. I'm a businessman with standards. Yeah, it might have been helpful to have Delta Team here, huh? After reading some of the files on the desk, we deduce that Irving's next destination is the oil field, situated in the marshlands of this area. We inform Josh of this new development and press on. As we fight along the cliffs, we are suddenly ambushed by a semi-truck carrying a giant flying BOW. Surprisingly, this fight is relatively easy. We're provided with plenty of proximity bombs beforehand allowing us to stagger the monster by placing them in its path. Then, after this, you can shoot at its underbelly, which damages it. Repeating this tactic leads us to emerge victorious. And uh, that wraps up chapter 2-2. O overall, it's a pretty decent chapter. I enjoyed the section in the mines, although they felt a bit short-lived. The boss in this level is okay, despite being very easy. Overall, it's not a bad chapter. Chapter 2-3 is a chapter. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's what it is. On the way back to meet up with Delta Team, we're ambushed by more motorcycle riding Magini. The rest of this chapter consists of an on-rails shooting section where our sole task is to protect the truck while being attacked by these new adversaries. It's not particularly difficult, but... Uh, 
I, uh, I, I, I want to talk about something here. I really dislike it when people say things like, but it's not Resident Evil. I, I like, I, I think we all need to accept that the Resident Evil franchise is constantly evolving and exploring different game types and niches. I don't subscribe to this idea that this game franchise needs to fit into a narrow box based on an archaic game design. Sure, I, I enjoy the fixed camera angle games. They're great for the horror genre, but the reality is people don't buy these types of games as much as they used to. At least nowhere near enough to ensure that Capcom can make their money back. And it's not necessary for a Resident Evil game to adhere to this style to be good. This alone should not define this franchise. Saying, but it's not Resident Evil is limiting an amazing franchise to just a couple games from the 90s and early 2000s. I really do not like this mentality. That being said, I can't stand this bombastic over the top approach. The whole game feels just like, let's do this, but bigger. Remember that minecart section in RE4? Well, let's have a Humvee section with mounted machine guns, motorcycles, trucks, fire, explosions, boom. It's, it's just too much. Why? Why try so hard, Capcom? Just just be yourselves. This 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 isn't you. You're you're trying to be something you're not, and it's painfully obvious. Well, it's not really a problem with Capcom anymore. They they're bringing the horror back to the franchise with more modern titles, and it's pretty cool to see. But but yeah, th this game is ridiculous. Uh, Eventually, we managed to escape the never-ending waves of Magini. However, upon re-entering the city, we discover the remains of Delta Team. Look out! He uh, <clears throat> kind of got kind of got uh, close to y'all without noticing. We jump back in the Humvee and start unloading into the Indesu. Uh, let's be honest, it's just it's really just the, the El Gigante from RE4. Th this fight feels kind of lackluster because you spend the entire time just shooting at him. It's not as engaging as an actual fight would be. This game was made during a time when turret sections were all the rage in shooter games. And uh, unfortunately, Capcom fell into this trap as well. We finally managed to kill him, and it wasn't nearly soon enough. Where are you, Josh? Sheva, you don't have to do this. You can still back out. I, I don't. I don't think she was giving off that impression at all. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I'm not here just for the mission. What are you talking about? A while back, I received some intel that my old partner was still alive. At first, I didn't know what to think. But when I saw the data file from Delta Team, I knew for sure. Jill is still alive. That woman in the data file? Are you even sure it's the same person? We were partners. I'm sure. Wait! Chris, wait! I don't have much time. I have to find her. I'm going with you. These are my people that are dying here. Are you sure about this? A second ago, you were ready to cut and run. When did she say that, Chris? You said that. What the f- What? What? <laughs> No, no one actually listens to Sheva in this game. <laughs> it's fucking stupid. <laughs> Copy that.
Looking back on chapter two, it's probably one of the weaker sections of the game. It's not really gripping in terms of gameplay, and most of the time the story as well. The really big standout was the mines, but yeah, it's kind of a weak set of chapters. An upside I suppose was getting to see more Kajuju settings like the docks and train yard. They're, they're very pleasing to play through I would say. Uh, let's talk about some of the main characters in the game. Chris Redfield, one of the most iconic protagonists in the franchise, returns here. I would say his portrayal is pretty disappointing in the game. However, if you really look back, Chris has never been particularly intriguing as a character. Wesker? Still alive? At least up to this point in the franchise, that is. He's always just been the good guy or, or, or the hero, you know? He, th th this archetype is even actually poked fun at in this game. There's only so much one person can do. Even a superhero like you, Chris. I'll fuck these bitches and I'm fucking all these hoes. I mean, person. I mentioned it earlier, but it seems they wanted to give Chris some more characterization in this game, involving elements of a disillusioned version of our hero. One that is questioning the actual worth of their fight. It's an intriguing and valuable storytelling element that could have gone somewhere, but it really doesn't. He ends up just being the hero, and it's unfortunate that Capcom doesn't do much more with him. What made Leon so captivating in Resident Evil 4 was his lighthearted nature. He was serious when he needed to be, but wasn't afraid to crack a wise joke here or there to lighten the mood. Think of a Marvel superhero before this archetype also just got slammed into the ground so many times that no one cares to even watch their movies anymore. The thing with Chris is they built him up to be a more serious protagonist and went nowhere really with it. His portrayal is disappointing here, and I wish I had more to say, but he's such a flat character that it's fair to assume if Sheva was nowhere in the game, we'd literally have no character for Chris at all. Everything Chris says and does in the game is just bounced off of Sheva or one of the other characters. He's one of our two main characters, yet has about the same characterization as, like, Luis from Resident Evil 4. It's just disappointing. His portrayal is overall uninspired, lacking a significant amount of character. Just a generic soldier tough guy from just about any Michael Bay era action film. You ever get the feeling you're expendable? Yeah. Just very disappointing for a returning character to get such poor treatment. Sheva Alomar, our partner in our journey, is also another missed opportunity as a character. Sheva is characterized mainly as a dependable partner willing to see her mission through to the end. You get the impression that she's fighting for something greater than herself exemplified through her past and how it intertwined with Umbrella and bioterrorism as well. However, beyond this, not much of her character is fully explored as it could have been. Many have accused Sheva of being placed in the game to fend off the wave of racism allegations being thrown at Capcom around the development of this game. I'll, I'll talk about that one later. And while I don't really believe this narrative personally, and Capcom themselves even deny this being true, it's hard not to chase this narrative when besides what was mentioned before, she's just a flat character. Don't worry though, anyone who's played this game, like myself, knows that everyone's characterization in this game is pretty bad, besides Wesker. He, 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 he's, he's just amazing. Much of what I said formerly about Chris can be applied here, as Sheva has an intriguing character backstory and elements to her that, if chased, could have led to an extremely well done character. However, as previously stated, Capcom didn't. Her portrayal is much stronger than Chris's. Karen Dyer does an excellent job here, and I wouldn't doubt that if she had more to work with, we would have had a phenomenal performance on our hands. Unfortunately, she's just delegated to bouncing most of her lines off of Chris. 
Yeah, just just a lost opportunity overall. A uh, quick honorable mention as well, since he shows up enough times in the game uh, for us to get a kind of feel for his character a bit. Josh Stone is a very compelling and well-portrayed side character. I don't necessarily feel it's important to put as much pressure on Josh as a main protagonist, but the bit we do see from Josh is portrayed well and you really get the impression of him being a very capable soldier. I really enjoy his portrayal, and though I must admit I don't really know how faithful his accent really is here. TJ Storm, the voice actor for Josh, doesn't have the accent naturally, so I'm not too sure personally. Sounds good enough for me though. Uh, yeah, I, I just really like his character. Uh, every time he's present, I just feel better. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, get, I get this kind of, kind of, kind of warm, warm, warm feeling in my 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 balls <laughs> yeah anyways uh he's a good character it's too bad all the other characters aren't nearly as likable as josh is chapter 3-1 begins with sheva and chris making their way to the kajuju marshlands sheva asks chris what happened to jill prompting chris to discuss the story through a flashback since i'm playing the gold edition of re5 completing this chapter unlocks the content lost in nightmares which explores the events of this flashback. Since I was going to talk about this DLC anyways, I figured it would be a good time to do this here. Set years before the events of Resident Evil 5, the flashback follows Jill and Chris as they explore the Spencer estate to locate Oswell E. Spencer, co-founder of Umbrella. Here, their goal is to actually locate Wesker. Upon entering the mansion, it's clear that something troubling has occurred prompting them to investigate further. With the main door in the hall locked, they have to explore the estate to try and find him. Okay, so Lost in Nightmares is total nostalgia bait. We have Chris and Jill exploring a mansion that looks very similar to the mansion in Resident Evil. This is obvious at this point, and I'm hardly saying anything new here. However, I, I really love this setting and how it pays homage to the original game. There's the Keeper's Diary you can find, which is line for line the diary from the remake. You have to make Jill play Moonlight Sonata to unlock a door for a key item. It's, it's pretty fun overall, but really short-lived. I, I played this chapter on normal difficulty, which meant there's no enemies actually that spawn in the mansion portion of the level. I'm pretty sure they spawn in on harder difficulties, but honestly, I didn't care enough to play through it again to find out. So ultimately, with no way forward, our goal is to unlock the pathway under the stairwell, which requires a crank. Initially, to gain access to this, we need to procure three passwords to access Spencer's computer and open a secret pathway to grab the crank. Upon grabbing the crank and using it on the passage, we find ourselves in some sort of dungeon where Spencer kept many victims of his machinations. Down here is where we face the first enemy of the level, carrying an anchor, and on top of this, we face many more of these guys while down here. They take a ton of bullets and will swing the anchor at you, causing a near instant death, much like the executioner from the main story. However, when you shoot these guys, they also secrete acid, so it makes them more of a tougher enemy overall. Making our way through this area, we eventually step onto a not-so-solid platform that collapses beneath us, bringing us to another damp dungeon area of the mansion. Down here, we are tasked with gathering many plates to open the path to the ladder out of here. In order to gain these plates, we must take out these guardians down here. Unfortunately, in the fall, we lose all the firearms we gathered throughout the chapter. So, we have to lure the enemies into spike ceiling traps where one character raises and holds up these traps while the other lures the guardian into the spike trap itself to meet its demise. Each time you use one of these traps, it knocks the trap out of commission. So you have to change up which trap you use as it goes on. You have to fight a couple of these guys as they only drop one tablet at a time. So after you do this, you're, you're finally able to climb the ladder. Emerging from the dungeon, we grab a couple handguns off the corpses of a couple bodyguards and start towards the door. Upon entering the door, we can see a dead Oswald E. Spencer on the ground and also Wesker. This fight goes well.
yeah, it's quite frustrating. He, he dodges nearly every shot you fire at him. Your best strategy appears to be countering his rushes, but it's challenging overall. I nearly died during this battle, but somehow I managed to deal sufficient damage to Wesker to bring the fight to a close. Are you trying to make me angry? Reflecting on Lost in Nightmares, I find myself quite fond of it. Sure, it's total nostalgia bait, but it's undeniably enjoyable. Exploring the mansion area brings back fond memories, and it's a refreshing break from the relentless action of the main game. It demonstrates that horror still has a place in this gameplay format even though the main game took a different direction. Admittedly, it's disappointing that the chapter is so short, and the lack of enemy variety is a drawback, plus the final boss is not particularly enjoyable. However, I still appreciate the return to a more simplified version of the game. It would have been great to see more content like this throughout the main story. So, as stated previously, Chapter 3-1 starts off with Sheva asking Chris about Jill and what exactly happened. Jill! Jill's body was never found and she was presumed dead. The person I saw in that data looked like her. I have to know if she's still alive. You two were close. We were partners. What about you? Why'd you join the BSAA? My parents were involved in an accident caused by a pharmaceutical company when I was young. Umbrella? Yes. I only found out later that the accident was to cover up the manufacturing of biological weapons for terrorists. They we're using Africa as a test bed for their experiments. Bioweapons were responsible for the deaths of my parents. And someone has to pay for that. I must say, I appreciate the small amount of characterization we get from Sheva here. It adds depth to her character that wasn't established before. Her backstory seamlessly integrates into the Resident Evil universe, making it believable that Sheva could have been an indirect victim of Umbrella's sinister experiments. So, over the course of this chapter, we must find a way to unlock a central door within this section of the marshlands. In order to do so, we must obtain four slates to insert into the door to unlock it. This is achieved by visiting various sections of the area and acquiring them. The first one is found on the body of a Delta team member with spears protruding from him. Afterward, hopping back on the airboat, we can navigate over to an area with some small huts. Here we come face to face with the Magini of this region, and they look totally not potentially insensitive at all. I mean, <laughs> there is an in-game explanation for this. Uh, later on in this very same chapter, we can find a file that kind of mimics the Keeper's Diary of the original Resident Evil, showcasing one of the Magini going through the stages of infection and detailing what was happening to them upon infection. 
It seems this strand of Las Plagas, which is now known as the Plagas Type 3, was meant to snuff out any potential weaknesses of the Type 2 strain. This resulted in the death of just about all the women and children infected by it, and for some reason made it so that successfully infected males of the population would put on garbs that resembled their ancestors rather than the more modern attire they had. This is <clears throat> kind of kind of funny. Um, I, I mean, the explanation of this is is funny, you know, it, 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 because like, isn't it kind of a strange side effect of the virus to to cause them to change their clothes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Capcom probably just did this to you know avoid controversy. <laughs> Anyways, we survive this ambush to grab the second slate. We take the airboat to another area in the swamp and grab the third slate where we are promptly ambushed yet again. Taking the airboat to the final area we must navigate a swampy environment with crocodiles in the water. Making our way to the main building in the swamp we can grab the fourth and final slate. The duo takes all the slates over to the exit and unlocks the door. Leading us to what looks to be some sort of village square of the marshlands. Per usual, we are ambushed here as well, and uh, we are introduced to another new enemy type called the Giant Magini. They're kind of similar to the uh, Big Man Magini seen back in Kajuju, at least uh, in terms of overall damage output and HP. Surviving this encounter, the duo eventually end up making their way to a gondola, exiting the area. This prompts the end of Chapter 3-1. Chapter 3-1 is certainly a a pretty good chapter. I like the sort of open world approach taken within the chapter, allowing you to grab all the slates in whatever order you choose. The Marshland setting is interesting and honestly does have a much more horror-centric tone than Kajuju did. The lack of sun kind of goes a long way here in this sense. The, the new designs for the Magini here are also terrifying, even though it's not necessarily accurate for a modern day West African setting. They're, they're just super creepy looking. Yeah. Overall, it's a pretty fun chapter. Cap Capcom did pretty good here. Chapter 3-2 is a another pretty solid chapter overall. We start in another swamp area where we can see the Magini feeding a Delta team member to one of the crocodiles. We power through this shithole of a swamp and go through a cave. Coming out of the cave, we find some tents decorated with the Trisol logo. They helped fund the BSAA. What the hell are they doing here? As Chris states here, Tricell is, in fact, a benefactor for the BSAA. Their presence here is not so puzzling the more you know about this corporation. Not that RE5 does a great job of explaining it, but Tricell is essentially, in all intents and purposes, the predecessor to Umbrella. So, following the destruction of Raccoon City, Umbrella was in some hot shit. Basically, Umbrella and Tricell were part of the Federation of Pharmaceutical Companies. Umbrella's declining reputation began to threaten all the other corporations with the Federation because it was revealed that these other corporations were supplying Umbrella with chemicals for its bioweapons program. These corporations, Tricell included, handed over documents regarding their dealings with Umbrella that would be used in the Raccoon Trials, resulting in Umbrella's business being suspended. However, not long after this, Tricell began to pick up the pieces of Umbrella, taking a special interest in bioweapon development. Though it's not a common knowledge in the story at this point, Tricell is a major figurehead in the infection of this region of Africa. This can be inferred by the file mentioned earlier, which mentions the man from the oil field offering these vaccines to the Magini, which were ultimately meant to infect them. Moving beyond these tents, we enter the refinery. We spot Irving entering the building as we are ambushed by a swarm of Magini. Unlike the tribal ones from the marshlands, these Magini resemble the ones from Kajuju, possibly indicating that Irving has enlisted them as his own men. Flames block the main path to enter the building, requiring us to operate several mechanisms to proceed. Doing so brings us face to face with two Chainsaw Magini. This time, however, we're better equipped with more effective weapons to deal with them, albeit not without some difficulty. 
Upon reaching the refinery, the duo encounters Josh. Josh? Shiva? You're alive. Are you okay? Well, how did you get here? We were at the port when we were attacked. And then, well, I ended up here. Where's the rest of the team? Shit. It's just the three of us now. Why did you not retreat? I mean, we are no match for them. I've got unfinished business. The hard drive containing data on the BOW experiment had a picture inside. The picture was of Chris's friend. A friend? Their conversation is abruptly interrupted by a sudden ambush from a horde of Magini. As Josh tries to release the elevator lock, we must fend off numerous enemies pouring through various windows into the facility. After Josh successfully opens the elevator, we ascend to the second floor, only to find another locked door. While Josh attempts to open it, we battle through more waves of enemies including another Chainsaw Magini. Once Josh opens the door, we can finally escape the onslaught. Are you okay? Yeah, I think so. I'm okay. It looks like Irving is trying to blow up the place and make his escape. You must stop him before it is too late. I'll try to find us a way out of here. All right. We'll go after Irving. Good, okay. Now there's a talk up ahead. That is probably where he's going to make his break. Copy that. And Josh! Be careful. The duo continues towards the docks, where we can observe Irving already getting ready to depart. Wait, isn't that... <laughs> Splendid timing! Just in time for the fireworks show! Boom! <laughs> wait! Chris, what the hell do you mean, wait? <laughs> Writing this game is stupid. <laughs> With the explosives primed to detonate and Josh positioned on the opposite side of the docks, we must hurry to reach the boat before the refinery explodes. Surprisingly, it proves to be quite manageable, and I reach the destination with plenty of time to spare. Quickly, we must go! Are you alright? Chapter 3-2 is also quite enjoyable. While the swamp at the start isn't particularly remarkable, I, I have to acknowledge that both the exterior and interior of the oil refinery provide a captivating setting, both visually and in terms of gameplay. The intense battle against waves of Magini infiltrating the refinery while waiting on Josh to unlock the elevator and door creates a tense and thrilling experience. Chapter 3-3 is probably the least compelling segment in the Marshlands section of the game. The trio begins their journey on the boat they used to escape. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you later. We got company. I'm on it. As the Magini swiftly close in, we must protect the boat while navigating through the oil fields drilling facilities. This involves brief defensive segments and moments where we disembark to unlock gates and advance further. It's rather routine. We, we simply progress through a few gate checkpoints until we reach Irving's ship.
Won't you two just die already? You're making me look bad. Who do you think got this entire operation off the ground? Research like this doesn't fund itself, you know. Yet everyone looks down on me. But not anymore. Don't do it! Irving injects himself with the dominant species Plaga, the same type used by the likes of Mendez, Salazar, and even Krauser from RE4. This Plaga grants them a degree of autonomy while infected. Irving transforms into a massive fish-like creature and initiates an attack against us. I'm not particularly fond of this boss fight. Interestingly, out of the four bosses we've encountered thus far, only one hasn't incorporated some sort of gimmick. Ouroboros involved the furnace, and Endesu utilized the turrets. The Popo Karimu uh, stands out as the sole traditional boss fight in the game up to this point. So we basically just bombard Irving with the turrets until he dies. It would be much simpler if Sheva weren't so carelessly shooting her normal ammunition and wasting all of it, while also constantly being damaged. Yeah, that was a bit anticlimactic. Chapter 3-3 is is decent. Uh, the boat defense part wasn't terrible, but it, it does feel a bit repetitive. And, and the, the boss fight is rather dull. Overall, though, reflecting on Chapter 3 and the Marshlands section as a whole, I found it quite enjoyable. The Marshlands definitely have a more eerie and menacing atmosphere compared to Kajuju. The first chapter with its small open section leading to a big ambush in the village is quite engaging. And chapter 3-2 set in the oil fields offers a lot of excitement, especially with the relentless waves of enemies while defending Josh. As mentioned earlier, it's mainly the last chapter that leaves a somewhat sour impression for me. Since this game has been listed among the Resident Evil titles that could potentially be remade, an old controversy has resurfaced thanks to Matt Perslow and the good old journalists at IGN. Alright, let's, let's lay it all out here. I don't believe this game is racist in any way whatsoever. In fact, to, to label it as such is ignorant of the game's plot, context, and overall intent. To provide some context on the original controversy, following the 2007 E3 reveal of Resident Evil 5, Capcom faced a backlash for depicting a white man shooting and killing Africans in their upcoming game. While this sounds alarming on the surface, there's a significant amount of context missing from this controversy. Not that this isn't obvious already, but these people are infected with a parasite that makes them murderous and violent. Shocking, I know, right? In a Resident Evil game? I, yeah, 
I, I don't know. Furthermore, the game is set in a fictitious West African country. It really feels like a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, doesn't it? Like, you can't really set the game in Africa without having to confront the reality of killing infected individuals who just so happen to be African. And let's be honest, if Capcom had made the enemies predominantly white, people would have probably not been happy with that either. Here, here, I'll just let my man TJ Storm, the voice actor for Josh, say it like it is. It's in Africa. It's been in Antarctica. It's been, I think, in Spain. It's been in the Midwest. It wasn't racist then, why should it be racist now? It's in Africa. Have fun with the game, play the game. Thanks, DJ. Yeah, obviously the voice actors for Josh and Sheva came out in an interview around this time where they highlighted the absurdity of this entire argument. And while I don't assume they speak for everyone as two people of color, I believe their opinions should carry more weight here. At the very least, more weight than Matt Perslow's. Yeah, b because we all know what it really is here. These people getting upset about this sort of nonsense aren't normal people like TJ Storm or Karen Dyer. They're more like this, or this, or even this. A, a bunch of chronically online individuals with so much free time and limited actual social interaction that they legitimately think this game is racist. How about you just play the game and point out what could be racist? Don't solely focus on the imagery of a white man shooting Africans or the concept of a white savior coming to rescue African people from the evil plaguing them. I mean, Sheva is the other hero in the game. And Chris really was just a guy doing his job as part of an anti-bioterrorism organization. He then pivoted around a quarter of the way through the game to focus on finding Jill, which is a completely personal stake. Also, it's worth noting that the main perpetrators in the game are all white. What an annoying ass fucking controversy. The, the fact that this was even brought back to life in the media is a frustrating event itself. And it, it's honestly the only reason I'm talking about it. This game is not racist, and the fact that this even has to be said is stupid. There's one thing I must say about the potential upcoming Resident Evil 5 remake, though. I have no freaking idea how they're going to plan to get around this type of controversy from happening again in today's landscape, okay? I, I don't know how they're going to navigate that shit. I, I, I wish them luck. Honestly, I do, because because the mob, the mob can be pretty pretty intense <laughs> chapter 4-1 is an uncharted game uh, not not really but but like kinda we arrive at the cave and prepare to explore after bidding farewell to Josh we proceed onward as we explore the cave's entrance we encounter a new variant of Plaga resembling a spider kind of reminiscent of those from RE4, but with some differences. Venturing further into the cave, we stumble upon an entire underground city. The, the setting proves to be an interesting place to explore. We, we engage in battles with more Magini down here and navigate through various traps, striving to survive them. Additionally, there's this rather ridiculous running sequence. <laughs> oh, 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 they even played it again. Oh my god. Uh. <laughs> Silly. In this other section, you have to manipulate the levers on the statues to unlock access to the exit located at the top of this temple-like structure. Before departing, we find ourselves facing another Popo Karimu. Fortunately, I had acquired a rocket launcher earlier in the first chapter of the Marshlands, allowing me to swiftly eliminate this creature. Ascending the stairs, we exit this area. However, our departure triggers a cutscene, introducing both new and familiar villains to this story. Missions are almost complete. Then we can leave. Good. You know, I was surprised Las Plagas was such a success. When you first arrived, I had my doubts. And now Ouroboros is complete. 
Your position at Tricell is secured. Oh, I have my eyes set on something much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> It appears your old friend, Chris Redfield, has come to pay you a visit. Do I sense concern? The plan is in its final stages. I will not tolerate delays. I believe I should thank you, Spencer. Chapter 4-1 is a decent chapter. Personally, I don't find the runes to be a particularly very fascinating setting for the franchise, uh, but, but it's alright overall. One notable advantage is that it enables the inclusion of more traps in the storyline, which might not have made as much sense in Kajuju or the Marshlands. While there aren't many traps, they, they do add a cool element to the chapter overall. Chapter 4-2 is the stronger of the two chapters here. In this chapter, our objective is to reach the worship area and unlock the main pathway that leads up to a stairwell leading ultimately to the pyramid at the cave's pinnacle. To accomplish this, we must retrieve three emblems to unlock the path. This entails visiting three different altars scattered throughout the worship area while contending with the Magini and these deadly sunbeams, I guess. Upon entering the pyramid, we find ourselves utilizing technology similar to the sunbeams to manipulate mirrors, ensuring the beams align with the elevator. After completing this task a few times, we finally reach the end of the chapter. It's at this point we encounter a surprising revelation, at least from a lore perspective. How can they survive underground? These are no ordinary flowers. Wait. Umbrella. What? What was Umbrella doing? I don't know. It doesn't look like anyone's been around for a while. You can be sure they wanted to keep this place a secret. Some of this equipment's got the Triso logo on it. Are they working together? These flowers held significant importance to the tribe in this region, as they were directly associated with a rite of passage. By successfully completing various trials and ingesting the toxic flowers, one would be perceived as a god king in the eyes of the tribe. These trials were crucial for ascending to the position of king. The Umbrella Corporation would come to refer to these flowers as the progenitor flowers. In the 1960s, Oswald E. Spencer, James Marcus, and Marcus's student, Brandon Bailey, conducted an expedition to explore the Stairway to the Sun where these flowers were found. To summarize, these flowers contain the progenitor virus, which Marcus utilized for the experiments that ultimately led to the discovery of the T-Virus. This revelation adds an intriguing layer to the lore of the game. While the game may falter in certain aspects regarding its connection to the broader franchise, this particular piece of lore is quite refreshing. 
Chapter 4-2, in my opinion, is stronger than 4-1. However, it still doesn't quite measure up to Chapter 3 as a whole. I appreciated the slight open world aspect of obtaining the three emblems. And once inside the pyramid, the laser puzzles weren't overly challenging, but they provided a welcome change of pace, allowing me to relax and enjoy some peace while solving them. Closing out Chapter 4, it's rather short. Upon reflecting on it, I, I do appreciate some aspects, while the ruins setting may not perfectly align with what I would want from the franchise. It, it works well with the, what the writers were trying to depict with, you know, the stairway to the sun. There aren't many new enemies beyond the spider plagas here, which aren't particularly noteworthy really. However, I, I did enjoy the trap set pieces, even the more outlandish ones here. And the small open world segment towards the end of the chapter is also, you know, quite cool. Overall, it, it's an okay chapter, but it still doesn't quite match the enjoyment I found in chapter 3, which in my opinion remains the best set of chapters this game has to offer. Graphically, Resident Evil 5 looks pretty good for its time in 2009. However, unlike former Resident Evil titles, Capcom wasn't necessarily ahead of the curve in the graphics departments. While it's not a standout in this era, it's not too bad looking either. Comparing it to other titles released around the same time and even before, it's not exactly groundbreaking. Additionally, there's an awful looking greenish gray filter that detracts from the visuals. A common trend in that era where game developers often applied these shitty looking filters over their games. Aesthetically, Resident Evil 5 is pretty solid. The settings capture what they set out to do quite well. I enjoy the early setting of Kajuju. While it's not necessarily scary, it does have a grimy allure as a shanty town that was once probably lively. It seems to have seen better days, and although we don't have a timeline for its downfall, it's likely representative of the Las Plagas' effect on the city, similar to the village in Resident Evil 4. The marshlands are excellent too, with a uh, flooded gray dingy allure to them, while they may not have as much character as some other settings, the insight into the tribe that once resided there is interesting, and the conflicts we face there, as well as the oil field, which is also a very nice, unique setting, complement this well. The ruins, though not exactly complementary of the Resident Evil franchise, are nice as well. They accomplish what they set out to do showcasing essentially an underground city that is long past its prime, primarily being used for its social right to become a king. They, they do remind me a lot of an Uncharted game, and these ruins excel just as well as they would in one of those titles. So, so yeah, it's pretty good. I like the lab setting, uh, along with the factory that is showcased in Chapter 5. The sort of rundown old Umbrella Lab is fascinating to explore from a visual standpoint, with all the animals in cages and blood on the ground. The mass amount of liquors in the chambers, it, it's all very fascinating. The factory is also pretty interesting, yet less so than the laboratory. And then finally, the tanker, you know, at the end of the game, is a very sweet setting in the franchise. One of the first RE games to introduce a ship as a setting. Dead Aim has this game beat there, but it's still intriguing nevertheless. It's, it's a cargo ship, so we don't really delve too deep into the ship, but it's still a nice setting. The enemies, from a visual design standpoint, are really good. They are frightening in many ways. Some are original, some are not so original. There are a lot of designs derived from RE4, which, yeah, that's kind of expected. You know, it's, it's Resident Evil 4, I mean, come on. That said, there are some unique designs for other enemies that are nevertheless captivating. The Marshland Magini, like, they don't they don't have lips, and that's, that's like, so freaking creepy looking and, and scary. All the Plagas variations are very intriguing and unique in their own way. It, it's really disgusting and gross looking. It's, it's just sweet, nice overall. Yeah, overall, aesthetically, I do really like Resident Evil 5. Not 
too many RE games have a bad aesthetic appeal. So this isn't so surprising here. You know, it's not different in that aspect, but yeah, yeah, that's pretty much all I gotta say about that. I, I think Capcom did a good job in this department. In chapter 5-1, we venture further into the Umbrella Laboratory, situated beneath and within the ruins we discovered previously. Within the laboratory, we come across numerous files and clues that establish connections between Tricell and Umbrella, ultimately tying into the series' uh, history involving the T-Virus and the downfall of Raccoon City. Continuing our exploration, we encounter liquors within the lab, marking a challenging and chaotic situation. It's a real shit show for me. Navigating through the lab, we arrive at a vast chamber designated for holding numerous subjects who were experimented on. While Chris investigates a list of candidates, he discovers Jill Valentine's pod. The platform descends, triggering a formidable boss battle. That's why. Well, it's not particularly difficult. The, the, the encounter proves more tedious than challenging. This crab-like creature, known as the U8, exhibits incessant movement, leading to frustration during the encounter, especially from my perspective. <laughs> Nevertheless, we successfully defeat it, only to find Jill's pod empty upon reaching it. Where is she? Mr. Redfield, how nice to finally make your acquaintance. Who the hell are you? Excella Guillermo. She works with Tricell. Nice. You've done your homework. An officer in the Global Pharmaceutical Consortium. Why? <laughs> As if I need to explain myself to you. Although, weren't you two given orders to retreat? So it was you. <laughs> Where is Jill? Jill? Even if I did know, you think I would tell you? Cut the crap! Tell me where she is! As soon as you two are done with your little vigilante mission, you should leave. There's nothing here worth throwing your life away for. She's lying. She knows something. It's time we get some answers. That wraps up chapter 5-1, which is uh, notably brief. Excluding the boss fight, it clocks in around 10 minutes. Uh, the return of the Lakers adds an exciting element, uh, and revisiting the lab setting in the series is a welcome change for this title. Chapter 5-2 is probably the worst chapter in the game. Transitioning into chapter 5-2, we depart from the platform area and promptly enter one of the least enjoyable sections for this chapter. The Magini now wield firearms, such as assault rifles, adding a frustrating layer to the gameplay. This exacerbates the mismatch between the game's mechanics and its style. Being forced to remain stationary while under fire is far from enjoyable, despite the availability of cover. Constantly peeking over cover becomes tedious, especially when facing enemies armed with stun rods who can quickly close in on you. This dynamic persists throughout much of the chapter, with only a brief intermission when Chris and Sheva receive incoming frequencies on their communicators. You know that voice. It's Excella. Not being handled, Albert. I'm looking forward to it. Albert? What? Why are you holding up a girl, Albert? Shit, Wesker. I thought he was dead. This revelation holds little significance for us players, as it, it doesn't add much depth to the characters or the plot. It feels like a weak method to inform Chris of Wesker's survival. Later in the chapter, we encounter a new enemy type known as Reapers, which can pose significant challenge if not approached cautiously. 
However, they are relatively scarce throughout the game, and with an automatic weapon, they can be dispatched quite easily. Eventually, the duo arrives at a laboratory where they encounter a sinister looking man seated atop a chair at the room's apex. Well, glad you could make it. Up here, you two. Excella, where's Jill? Jill, Jill, Jill. You're like a broken record, you know that? Just as single-minded as he said. You've spent so long trying to track down Ouroboros. Well, here, enjoy. The Ouroboros is a meteor, W. And you're planning on selling it to terrorists? Hmm, good guess, but no. While it does resemble the B.O.W. based on the progenitor virus, I have no intention of selling it to terrorists. Then what are you using it for? <laughs> Evolution. It's a philosopher's stone, one that will choose through DNA who shall proceed to the next stage. My vision and his combined now made a reality. Evolution? What are you talking about? Oh, you'll find us soon enough. Everyone will. <laughs> Looks like he wasn't worthy. Only the chosen ones are fit for the coming new world. So, uh, wait! Yay! Uroboro! The encounter is reminiscent of the previous fight in the game. But this time, it's mandatory. There's a flamethrower available in the room, albeit with a recharge requirement. So you have to constantly use it and put it back and then use it and then put it back for this entire fight. This battle proves exceedingly frustrating for reasons I can't quite pinpoint. Essentially, you must target the orange bulb-like protrusions to enable proximity to the monster, allowing you to ignite it. Subsequently, you can target the smaller bulbs that emerge to gradually eliminate this Ouroboros entity. Y yeah, I, I, I don't like the idea of this enemy at all. I, I despise this chapter. Shooting enemies feels out of place and utterly unsatisfying, resulting in frustration rather than enjoyment. The end boss is also pretty dreadful, making this chapter the worst one in the entire game. I wish I could erase this from my memory and, and never, never return again. Chapter 5-3 serves as the concluding chapter for this section, and it's a considerable improvement over the previous one. However, it still does reign in excessive action game elements that dominate this portion of the game. We navigate through the lab, traverse the warehouse's final section, and eventually find ourselves amidst some ruins. Lowering a bridge to access the ruins proves to be more challenging than anticipated particularly due to the abundance of liquors here. This is compounded by the fact that you are separated from your partner here, making the situation even more precarious. The duo ventures into the ruins where they encounter Excella, who stands ominously with her back turned to them. Why would she possibly be facing that way over there? Like, well, what is she looking at? Bravo. Damn it, where's Jill? Chill? Maybe I'll tell you. Maybe I won't. Stop playing around. We want some answers. You haven't changed.
Wesker. You are alive. This is Wesker. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been somewhat intriguing if this was the moment served as the reveal for Wesker? Although it wouldn't have been surprising to players given the flashback earlier in the game, it could have added a layer of suspense and even anticipation for the scene. Well, isn't this one big family reunion? I would expect you to be happier to see us. Us? So slow to catch on. Jill. Jill, it's me, Chris. What? Are you sure that's her? The one and only. <laughs> Despite the fact that the game's story becomes more enjoyable from this point onward, this part is rather underwhelming. Fighting Wesker in this current state isn't particularly enjoyable. It's very similar to his encounter in the Lost in Nightmares chapter. However, since this is likely the player's first experience to this style of Wesker fight, it can be very frustrating. Adding to the challenge, Jill intermittently takes shots at us during the battle, and inadvertently hitting her could result in her death. Similar to Lost in Nightmares, the goal isn't necessarily to defeat Wesker, but rather to outlast him until the timer runs out. Which is how I managed to conclude this encounter. I expected more of a challenge after all this time, Chris. How disappointing. Yes. Go! Wesker, stop! Time for games, Chris. I've got work to do. Have fun watching Jill suffer. Wait, what did you do to her? What's that on her chest? We have to get it off her. Now, the task at hand is to remove the spider-like device from Jill's chest. Unlike the battle with Wesker, this is relatively straightforward. You simply need to stun her repeatedly by countering her attacks, or by intruding her brainwashed mind by pressing a button when near her. Once stunned, you can attempt to remove the device from her chest. Although the process is somewhat repetitive, it goes smoothly, and I successfully managed to detach the device from her. Jill. Jill. Are you all right? Chris. I'm so sorry. It's okay. 
You're Sheva, right? Yes. I couldn't control my actions. Oh, but God, I was still aware. Oh, forgive me. It's all right. Thank you. Listen, I'm gonna be all right. You do need to stop him. We can't just leave you here. You have to. This is your only chance. If Wesker succeeds, Uroboros will be spread across the globe. Millions will die. Oh, yeah, but... I'm all right. You need to stop him. Chris, you're the only one who can. Before it's too late. Don't you trust your partner? As Chris and Sheva make their way out of the ruins, they witness Wesker and Axela boarding a ship, intended to facilitate Wesker's plan to spread Ouroboros. With this event, the chapter draws to a close. It's arguably the longest subchapter in the fifth chapter overall, but it's tolerable. Despite the frustrations with the gunplay, the intense encounter with the liquors adds some variety. Although, I didn't enjoy the Wesker fight, I appreciate the epic atmosphere it created, as well as the subsequent battle to free Jill from the device on her chest. Chapter 5 as a whole is disappointingly weak. While I appreciate the return to a lab setting, the increase in gunfights makes the action feel lackluster and even frustrating at times. If given the choice, I wouldn't revisit any of these chapters again. Enough said. The original soundtrack in this game is solid, but it doesn't quite reach the heights of previous RE titles. While it's not lacking quality, I find myself not fully immersed in the music this time around. Many of the tracks tend to blend together, lacking distinctiveness overall. However, there are some notable exceptions, the result screen theme for instance, effectively evokes the sense of a safe haven like the old school safe room themes and it fits seamlessly into the game's atmosphere. Another good example, the Executioner's theme also masterfully captures the tension of facing an overwhelming foe, enhancing the experience of encountering this bullet sponge of a mini-boss. Similarly, the final Magini battle theme exudes a sense of impending climax, reminiscent of the intensity found in RE4's iconic chopper gunner sequence. Moving on to another fantastic track, the Mercenaries theme stands out with its infectious catchiness, perfectly complementing the adrenaline field action of the mode.
Finally, the track accompanying Jill's rescue from the device on her chest is a highlight, delivering a gripping and emotional experience as you fight to save your friend. While RE5's soundtrack has its moments, it falls short compared to its predecessors, lacking that standout factor. It's not subpar, but it doesn't quite live up to the franchise's legacy of exceptional soundtracks. Since I interrupted the main story last time to discuss Lost in Nightmares, I'll do the same for this game's other DLC. Desperate Escape focuses on two of my favorite characters in the game. Jill and Josh, who unfortunately didn't receive enough screen time in the main game. Immediately after Chris and Sheva depart from the ruins, Jill collapses, possibly due to the effects of the device. She's awakened by Josh, and together they decide they must desperately escape <laughs> onto a helicopter to pursue Sheva, Chris, and the ship. What follows is an action-packed chapter filled with non-stop adrenaline. Surprisingly, someone at Capcom must have gotten the memo on how irritating the gun-wielding Magini were, as they're almost non-existent throughout this entire chapter. Thank God for that. Essentially, you run through the port where the ship was docked to reach Josh's chopper and make your escape. Along the way, you encounter numerous Magini, leading to some, in my opinion, better executed action set pieces. The chapter reaches its climax on a building where the duo must hold out for an extended period of time. This segment is particularly enjoyable as the game throws a relentless onslaught of challenges at you, intensifying the experience. Strangely, these intense moments made me appreciate the game more, and I found myself genuinely enjoying this chapter. It's just pure fun and a, a great way to unwind and immerse yourself in all the action nonsense. Overall, I really liked it. Unfortunately, the chopper pilot gets blown up. The two take off after Chris and Sheva to aid them in their fight against Wesker. Chapter 6-1 starts with the duo near the bow of the ship, navigating through containers and facing numerous Magini. As they move towards the ship's stern, they enter the ship and discover a lab within, where they encounter Excella. What's going on here? Nothing that concerns either of you. We're not giving you an option, now spit it out! Tell us what we want to know and you won't get hurt. Where's Wesker? If you can behave yourselves, maybe I'll tell you. Damn it! She's tough. I'll give her that much. What's this? Chris, is this... Whatever it is, Excella seemed protective of it. Chasing after Excella, the duo encounters more Magini, leading to more gunfights. They also face a Gatling gun-wielding Magini, reminiscent of JJ from RE4. After defeating him and obtaining a keycard from his corpse, they enter an elevator, triggering a cutscene revealing the flashback of what occurred at the Spencer Estate all those years ago. You've made it this far. Too bad you won't make it much further. The new superior breed of humans, given birth by the progenitor virus. The Wesker children were entrusted with endless potential. Of them, only one survived. You. Are you saying I was manufactured? I was to become a god. <laughs> 
creating a new world with an advanced race of human beings. However, all was lost with Raccoon City. Despite that setback, your creation still holds great significance. <laughs> Now my candle burns dimly. Uh, ironic, isn't it? For one who has the right to be a god. To face his own mortality. The right to be a god. <laughs> is now mine. The right to be a god. You. Arrogant even until the end. Only one truly capable of being a god deserves that right. I feel it's worth mentioning. So, Oswell E. Spencer here basically spills the beans on a concept that is explored more in a file we can find later in the game. Uh, essentially though, Albert Wesker was a product of Project W, a eugenics project initiated by Oswell E. Spencer, rooted in the discovery of the progenitor virus found in the flowers. Spencer's aim was to create an advanced human race, but lacking funds, he co-founded Umbrella with James Marcus and Edward Ashford to finance his vision. Children were carefully chosen as candidates for this program, and one such child was Albert Wesker. These children were given the best education that money could buy, and they were meant to carry out Spencer's ideals. Upon maturity, they entered the real world, all getting jobs, and uh, in this time, Albert became a researcher for Umbrella. In 1998, candidates were infected with the progenitor virus. Most died, but Albert survived, gaining superhuman abilities. Wesker adopted Spencer's vision, aiming to usher in a new world through Ouroboros. The concept skips the process of raising children though, focusing mainly on a select few who can ingest Ouroboros and ascend. This becomes Wesker's plan. It all kind of led to this. This was Wesker's overarching goal. <sighs> this somewhat diminishes Wesker's character in my opinion. Throughout the franchise, his motives remained elusive. Initially betraying the stars team, he's later revealed to be working for Umbrella, even to go so far as betraying them. He causes havoc on Rockfort Island, orchestrates the events in Resident Evil 4, which he goes on to command Ada and Krauser to retrieve the Plaga sample. His true endgame remained mysterious, adding to his enigmatic persona. It's revealed that Wesker is simply a megalomaniac, envisioning himself as a god, ushering in a new age with a superior breed of humans. Look, eugenics is definitely evil, but is this level of evil really fitting for Wesker. Wesker never felt like the big bad in Resident Evil up to this point. He was more of a shadowy figure, a dual antagonist to whoever the main antagonists of that game actually were. I, I guess they had to build something eventually, but he's just R.E. Hitler. It's not very imaginative for this character's conclusion. Anyways, th that's the end of chapter 6-1. It's an okay chapter. Um, the, the ship is cool. I, I really like the setting and the, the gunfights are, are uh, still stupid, but you know what? 
what are, what are you gonna do? So we exit the interior of the ship and upon arriving back on the deck, we can see a mass mound of bodies just kind of laying there. What the hell happened here? Yeah, anyways, the duo run into the bridge of the ship, with Excel becoming a massive mound of shit. We find ourselves going through the bridge and emerging once again back on the outside. Now this time we have much more of a vantage point to actually fight Excel. Fortunately, we grabbed a key card as well to grab the satellite targeting device out here. Uh, it's basically just a targeting laser that prompts a satellite to shoot a concentrated laser wherever it's locked onto. So uh, yeah, you just aim it at the bulbs and then um, yeah, eventually Excella dies. It's not a hard fight. Um, most of Excella's swinging attacks can be dodged, making the only real obstacles in the chapter these miniature Ouroboros shits that attack you. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's it for chapter six dash two. Yeah, uh, it's basically just a boss chapter. Um, it's, it's okay, I guess. Al al almost there, guys. We're almost there. Chapter 6-3 is the final chapter of the game, and, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty long one. With Excella now dead, we can set our sights on Wesker. Re-entering the bridge, we can see on a camera that Wesker is getting prepped to leave an assault bomber he'll use to spread Ouroboros. When Jill said Wesker was planning to spread Ouroboros throughout the world, He's planning to use this to spread it. Wesker, there he is. Come on, let's go. Jill, are you all right? I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Just listen carefully. There's something I need to tell you. Wesker's superhuman strength. It comes from a virus, but the virus is unstable. In order to maintain a balance, he must inject himself regularly with a serum. So if we cut the supply of serum, he loses his strength. Affirmative. But he just took a dose, so it's going to be a while before he needs another one. Damn. Listen, Excella said that the amount administered has to be precise. So if he injects too much, it should act like a poison. I think she used the serum label PG-678W. PG-678W? I'm going to try to find a way to escape. You need to find that serum. Excella always kept it with her, and in that tache case. Jill, come in! Jill! Shit. Chris, this is it. Well, uh, isn't, isn't that lucky? Entering the elevator, we come out well below the ship's deck, and clearly this place has seen better days. With the ship essentially screwed, we have to fight our way to the assault bomber. The ensuing onslaught is a pretty fun romp to play through. I, I just kinda enjoy epic, conclusive 
fights, I suppose. We fight a couple Gatling Gun Magini and loot their key cards to finally face Wesker. Your plans are finished, Wesker. There's no way out this time. Don't you two ever tire of failing in your mission? You've really become quite an inconvenience for me. Really? Yeah. Yeah, you're you're saving the world. Is that what you're doing? God, man. All right, let's let's just get this shit over with. Okay, here in this fight, there's some more speedy Wesker nonsense. Given his powers, we can't exactly just jab him with the serum, so we've got to turn off all the lights in the hangar, allowing us to sneak up on Wesker and fire a rocket at him, which he'll grab at the last minute. You can shoot it, and this will stagger Wesker. One partner, Chris or Sheva, will hold Wesker down while the other jabs him with the serum. Managing to do this causes the end of this fight. This, this cutscene is pretty long, so I'm, I'm just going to skip over this a bit here. Uh, you get it. Yeah, they, they, they catch up to the assault bomber. Ooh. Oh, yeah, and then we also have the, the, the best scene in the game. <laughs> I don't need anyone else. I have big balls. In less than five minutes. We'll reach Vader's Death Star. George Bush will be released into the atmosphere, ensuring complete global masturbation. Okay, yeah, you get it. It's more fighting stuff. Um, this this is another one of those QTE cutscenes that I just didn't have to do. So, yeah. I like that Wesker still has the samurai edge, by the way. It's pretty cool. So, the team lands in a volcano. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wesker shows up again, too. I should have killed you years ago. Chris. Your mistake. It's over, Wesker. Over. <laughs> I'm just getting started. Die. 
More Ouroboros. Nice. Nice. I love that. <clears throat> I love Ouroboros. Yeah, I do. The fight ensues with Wesker delivering some amusing lines. The human race requires judgment. Chris! Natural selection leaves the survivors stronger and better. The iconic boulder punch moment happens here, and the battle with Wesker commences. I ended up using all my ammo in this fight, so I had to rely solely on knife attacks for the last portion of it. Wesker's repetitive attacks make it somewhat manageable, um, although it was, it was still pretty challenging, um, just because the knife doesn't do like any damage at all, but I, I, I managed to, to make it. <laughs> That's Resident Evil 5. I mean, not exactly. Uh, we, we do get this last scene in the chopper, which finally ties into what Chris said at the very beginning of the story. over. Yes. Finally. More and more I find myself wondering if it's all worth fighting for. For a future without fear? Yeah. It's worth it. Yeah, not, not exactly <laughs> impactful, was it? The story of Resident Evil 5 is somewhat lackluster, blending elements of seriousness with over-the-top action in a way that doesn't quite land. It struggles with explaining key plot points, often requiring players to rely heavily on scattered files found throughout the game to clarify what the story actually is. Unlike, you know, previous titles, in the series which had these files supplementing 
the main story with world building and, and helping to solve puzzles throughout the game. Here, they, they are essential for actually understanding what is going on. Yeah, uh, overall, the story is a pretty weak aspect of the game. Oh shit, it's just that part when I talk about the unlockables. <clears throat> After completing Resident Evil 5, you unlock the Mercenaries mode, which offers solo or cooperative play with four characters to choose from, each with multiple variations. Similar to Resident Evil 4, the mode tasks players with defeating enemies within a time limit while collecting time bonuses and score multipliers. The mode features stages mostly taken from the main story, with added variety in enemy and boss types, overall extending the game's lifespan. Additionally, the RE5 Gold Edition includes the Mercenaries Reunion, introducing new characters like Josh, Excella, Rebecca, and Barry, which just expands the mode's roster, adding for even more variety. The Versus mode and RE5, although available, struggled to maintain an active player base and is now largely deserted. The mode pits players against each other using the same roster and stages as the regular mercenaries mode with the objective of eliminating the opposing team. However, due to gameplay mechanics not being well suited for this type of competition, many players found it lacking in enjoyment. Overall, it was considered weak, and finding other players to play with became increasingly difficult as time went on. Some other unlockables in RE5 include bottle caps purchasable from the menu. While these are interesting to collect, I probably would have preferred an actual model viewer instead. You can unlock infinite ammo for all guns in the game by completing the main story. Then you can turn on the infinite ammo feature in the bonus menu and then fully upgrading the desired weapon. And then after that, you can purchase the infinite ammo unlock from the menu. Additionally, there are some special weapons earned from upgrading regular ones, many of which can also be made infinite. These unlockables add depth to the game and provide players with exciting options. You can also unlock various costumes in the game. Chris's safari costume is unlocked after beating the main story, but it's not particularly appealing with its zebra print. Sheva's clubbing outfit looks goofy and she's all in gold and stuff. Shooting the BSAA emblems unlocks additional costumes. Chris gets his stars uniform, reminiscent of the first game, while Sheva's tribal outfit is, well, quite, quite revealing. <laughs> DLC costumes include Chris's warrior costume and Sheva's business attire, which uh, looks kind of like Hunnigan's outfit. There's also Chris's heavy metal look with tattoos and, and metal armor, and Sheva's fairy tale outfit resembling Little Red Riding Hood sort of. These add replayability and some humorous variety to the game's experience. In conclusion, Resident Evil 5 offered quite the experience with its fair share of ups and downs. Lots and lots of downs. Resident Evil 5 falls short of its predecessors and even subsequent titles in the franchise. It shifts away from horror to focus solely on action, with fewer horror undertones compared to RE4. However, it doesn't excel as an action game really either. Resident Evil 5's gameplay feels unsatisfying, drawing from an outdated era in gaming even upon its release. The story presentation lacks focus and fails to captivate while the characters lack standout qualities in their presentation. While there are aspects of Resident Evil 5 that I enjoy, such as the soundtrack or the extensive unlockable content, it suffers from feeling too much like a copy of Resident Evil 4 without adding enough new elements to distinguish itself. Resident Evil 5 seems to suffer from an identity crisis, borrowing heavily from Resident Evil 4 and other action games of its time without truly understanding what made them successful. As a result, it doesn't excel in any particular area and falls short compared to other games in the Resident Evil franchise. Elsewhere in this franchise, you can find better action, horror, gameplay, 
music, co-op mechanics, story, villains, overall quality, all like basically everything. Despite enjoying certain aspects of the game, it ultimately leaves a feeling of disappointment and a wish for it to be different and better in various aspects. Nevertheless, Resident Evil 5 achieved massive commercial success, becoming the highest selling title in the franchise up to that point. It would go on to hold this position until 2023 when the RE2 remake surpassed it in sales nearly five years after release. With this massive commercial success, Capcom created history not just for the franchise, but for themselves as a company. And you know what that means. Heir to a very special blood type. Here's something to remember you by. Put your gun down, Chris. She's a key witness. We need her. A witness? She's the one who did all this! Resident Evil 6. And that is it for the video. It is like almost 3 in the morning, and uh, I just finished editing. Uh, this monster of a video. <clears throat> I, I, I must say this is probably the highest effort video I have ever made, um, you know, to date. And I am pretty proud of it. Um, I, I, I actually really like it a lot, I think. Honestly, I haven't watched it as a whole piece, just in segments as I was editing it. And, uh, I think it's good. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of it. Yeah, I, uh, I, it's probably one of my favorite videos to date for sure. Um, yeah, no, it's it. I, I, I don't. I, I didn't log the amount of hours that I spent working on this, but uh, it, it was a while. I think it was. <laughs> it was a lot of editing, a lot of editing, a lot of writing, just a, a lot. This the script took me like almost two weeks. Editing took me almost two weeks. Like it, it, it was ridiculous. Um, but yeah, <laughs> uh, thank you for watching all the way to the end. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to uh, hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, we're almost at two thousand subs now, which is amazing. I, I you know, it's like almost a thousand subs within another month time, which is just so crazy. Uh, to me you know still that i i'm growing at the rate that i am it's 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 pretty amazing so so you know thank you for all that if you don't already know i am uh, currently creating a video series about the resident evil franchise and there are still many more games left to explore from here so if you're new here expect more videos uh in this vein about other future resident evil titles to come leave a comment sharing your opinion on resident evil 5 I would like to hear all of your opinions about it, um, you know, whether you agree with me or you don't agree with me. Um, you know, I think it's good to get further insight about the, the franchise from other people. I, I didn't think Resident Evil 5 was, you know, super awesome, but you might, you know, uh, and I'd be interested to hear about it. Yeah, so uh, the next game I'll be focusing on is going to be Resident Evil Revelations, as it is the following title in the release order, you know, for the games that I've been covering. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I should have that out within a month from now, probably or so. I, yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> I expect it to be about the same amount of time, like a month. Anyways, uh, thanks again for watching the video all the way to the end. And uh, as always, guys, take care.